Yeah, let's begin by taking a look at what happened in the last lecture and deciding on the basis of that some things to examine more carefully. So here's the notes from the last lecture, and I'm just going to walk through them. Um, uh, you remember the fact that we have to think about the single cycle map. And, and we did this example carefully. Um, and we're prepared, uh, or I assume you also are prepared to do some other examples carefully if you want to. But I was going to work out the standard Kovana homology of the trefoil knot by this uh, organization. And I didn't get around to doing a set of slides on it. And it wouldn't be a good idea for me to do that one out by hand in front of you because it will take too long. Uh, so I suggest we push the exercise to next week and I will create a prepared slide for it so you can compare what you did. On the other hand, um, there are some remarks about the way the homology works that you can see by doing much simpler examples. For example, if we had a little curl, uh, what will happen to the complex? Well, a good example to understand that with is just a little curl on a on a non knot. You can uh, generalize this if you want to, and think about the complex with one little curl added in relation to the complex without a curl. But let's look at this one, and I think we calculated this, and you will notice what happened when we calculated it. We could compare it with the on knot. And in the case of the unknot, we found that there was a Z at grading minus one and another Z at grading one in, in, um, in homological grading zero. These are the quantum gradings at minus one and one Zs. On the other hand, when we did it with the curl, we, had, uh, we found ourselves with the Zs at minus two and zero. And you can think of this if you like, it helps to organize what the grading shifts mean. You see, you're getting the same homology, but with grading shifts. Uh, the, the, um, um, and, uh, and it's still, of course, in the zero homology, but with a grading shift. And the question is, what does this grading shift mean? Um, so um, if you look at it, um, and think about where the contributions are to the polynomial, well then remember that the J, uh, that when you're finding the polynomial from this chart, then it's the J that gives you the Q degrees in the polynomial. So we have a Q to the minus two here, and we have a Q to the zero here, giving us a polynomial of Q to the minus two plus one, which um, in fact is what you would get if you expanded the polynomial, right? You go uh, X smooth it minus Q times that and work it out. And you get Q to the minus two plus one for the polynomial, which is Q inverse times Q plus Q inverse times the value of the loop. So you see the polynomial got shifted by a Q to the minus one from the unknot. And indeed the homology gets shifted exactly the same way as the polynomial. If you take the, the homology for the unknot and you shift it by minus one on the grading, it takes the gradings at minus one and one to minus two and zero. So this tells you what happens. And I just want to do another example of the same thing. So you see it happening and you can try this out on other examples, but let's look at this one. Here I have, I have the opposite curl. And with the opposite curl, you find, I leave you the calculation um, direct calculation to you, but you find that you get multiplied by minus Q squared, which says that if we started with, uh, with the unknot, which is over here now at minus one, one, and you applied two, added two to those gradings, you would get one and three. And so you would expect to find the homology in one and three. But, um, but there is also the matter of what happened to the placement of the homology. And you see that the homology ends up in the first homology, not in the zero homology. So I leave it to you to think about that uh, for next time. Why 
uh, what is the rule going to be for shifting the homological grading, which may get shifted just as well. But if you compare with what happens with the polynomial and what happens with the complexes, then you can see what went on. The question, of course, is, um, uh, what do I want to say? No, I don't want to say anything more about it right now. But uh, the point is, you should do a little more work with the examples to see how those gradings shift. All right, then this is an exercise that I um, said I would do, and I will, okay, after we've finished surveying what happened. Oh, and maybe we should do the other one as well. Um, no, I'll leave it. I, I think this is enough exercise, but there another exercise would be to work on the notoid uh, with this. Um, and there are many other examples. Trefoil will come up again. And then we talked about nautoids. That's even from the previous week. Um, and I won't bother you with it. But then we talked about the, what happens with, uh, no, I'm going to skip that. Um, we started talking about what happens with Covano homology for virtuals and the single cycle map. And we talked about the source sync orientations and the production of cut points when you try to put down a source sync orientation on a um, on a virtual diagram. And uh, then I introduced to you the uh, involution uh, uh, on the algebra that we're going to use and how we're going to there how we're going to associate a source sync orientation to each oriented crossing and also a local order of smoothings, um, uh, smoothing cycles. Um, and so you might jot this uh, little picture down so that you can compare it with different calculations that we will do as time goes on. Um, but we have both local order of cycles and if a mapping if one of our mappings reverses a local order of cycles, then there will be a minus sign from that. And, um, and, and otherwise, we, uh, we are going to introduce minus signs when we move the algebra around um, according to how many, the parity of the number of cut points that we go through. And that will define the boundary mappings. And and then I gave you some examples. So let's go and look at the examples one more time. Here is uh, an example uh, for this little unlink here, unknot here. And the corresponding source sync orientations are producing cut points here and here. And now we're looking at the Kovanov complex and I'm considering what happens as I go around the square this way or when I go around the square this way. When I go around the square this way uh, uh, using two eta's, the mapping is zero because we've assumed that eta is equal to zero. When we go around the, uh, the square in the other direction, um, uh, then the first thing that happens is, um, is this co-product which started right here. Um, now, I have labeled on this diagram uh, a one. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I've labeled a green one, uh, which is what the algebra is. Um, so I have it algebraically labeled with a one. You can try x. x will go to x tensor x, and you can then multiply. But if x goes to x tensor x, and then you multiply x squared is 0 in this algebra, so there isn't any worry about this square. But on the other hand, one goes to delta of one. And delta of one is one tensor x plus x tensor one, where the upper one is on the little circle and the lower x is on the big circle so in that way. Um, but then we're using this local coefficient system, which means that we are going to, we are going to, um, we are going to, transport the algebra that labels on that circle over to the other site where we're going to multiply. 
We do a multiply there. Now, what happened in this example is that what was a two becomes a one and what was a one becomes a two. So there actually is a sign change um, due to local to global order here when we do the transport. That's a global sign change, however, and is not uh, is it would contribute to making this commuting square anti-commuting. It's not going to be commuting, but uh, in this case, since it's going to come out zero, we can ignore it. The other thing that's significant is how it comes out zero, because when I transport the one on this upper circle up here, it becomes a one, of course. When I transport the X, on the other hand, it goes through a cut point and ends up on the top a minus X. When I transport this X, it's on the upper circle and stays X and the one becomes a one. So only one thing gets transported, the X tensor one um, and the one tensor X. One of them becomes, minus, becomes X bar. They both become minus because of the local to global order. And so the result, the final result is that we get minus x minus minus x, which is zero. And that's the whole story. And that square anti-commutes at zero, but it anti-commutes. So that's a nice example worth looking at more than once to see that the thing is indeed working the way advertised. And another example that we looked at was this one, where there aren't any cut points. It's a classical link diagram, but um, we are watching the local to global orders. And what happens in the local to global orders is that uh, you go around uh, co-product, product, co-product, product, product. When you go across the top, um, you, um, you go from, um, from a single cycle, uh, to a double in the order one, two. And then you multiply and you see there isn't any problem of comparing local to global orders because it's, there's two and then there's one. But on the other hand, when you, and in any case, if you look at the way the local to global orders work, they're the same. That is what was locally a one is still locally a one and what was locally a two is still locally a two. But on the other hand, when you go from two to one along the bottom, what was locally a one, um, uh, I'm sorry, up here, or what was locally a one and then a two um, switches. So let's do it in order so it's clear. I start here. Uh, and um, and in order to go across the top, I have the one up here, but I transport the one down here in order to do the co-product here, and I go here. Um, and I go here. And then what happens now is, that I transport this up to the other one in order to do the multiplication. And it is at that point that we go from one to two and from two to one. So at that point, there is a local to global order switch and that puts a minus sign in that one. Um, and, uh, and that's the only place where this happens in the fourfold um, pattern. So we get one minus sign going around the square and it anti-commutes. So that's, that's, those two examples contain just about all of the phenomena that occur here to make this complex work. Now, what else in review? Not so much. So that's where we were. And uh, now let's um,
let's do a bit of the homework then. So uh, I also wanted to make, oh, I wanted to make another remark about the grading shifting. I'm only talking about the quantum grading shifting and we'll think about the homological grading shifting actually in a moment. You can see a good example of it here, but we need to systematize the rest of that. But consider the second itemized remove. When you uh, are calculate the polynomial, you multiply by minus Q. And so that tells you that, at, that as far as the Q grading is concerned, the Q grading on a diagram with the randomized remove pattern in is going to be multiplied by, and you're going to shift the Q grading up by one from the, uh, from the place where the move wasn't, to shift it up by one. And then if you go to the comparison of the complexes, you can see what happened to that and why it happened. Because you see, when you compare the complexes, and we went through this comparison a couple of, of times ago, that you are comparing the zeroth level of this complex with the one level of this complex. So, the, so homology in level zero here is going to turn into homology at level one here. And that's why you're getting homo homological level shifting in order to compare the complexes. And you can go back and do the same exercise on the other two Reitermeister moves and see where the homological shifting had to happen. So think of that as a further exercise and then we'll, we'll, we will pack it all up next time. Um, and, um, and as far as the Q is concerned, that involves checking the way the gradings work internally like we did before. And so there's yet another exercise to do here, which is to see that indeed the Q gradings are shifting as advertised. So that's an exercise. Okay. Now to a concrete exercise. This shouldn't be too hard to do. This is a fairly simple one. Here's a truffle knot, but, um, but it's a virtual truffle knot. And we're gonna work mod two. And then you have another exercise and that is, do it again over the integers. That involves using the, um, the orientations and uh, local to global orders that we were doing before. Just run everything again, but I'm going to just do it mod two. So let's go back over here um, in, in homological zero. Um, and what can happen? Um, it, could be, um, it could be at uh, grading. Uh, minus one if it's labeled with an X. And it could be, and it would be at grading uh, one uh, if it's labeled with a one. And that's all there is there. Now, up here in one, um, we add one, right? Remember the J is equal to the number of B smoothings, which is the I, plus the sum of sines, the J is equal to I plus lambda. So, um, so the J's here, are, are the, what's the lowest J you can get? You have a minus one on this, you have an X labeling this, but it's raised by one, so it ends up in zero. Um, and it, uh, and it has an X in it, um, and that's an X comma zero. And the other possibility is a zero comma X because we're in a direct sum. All right. Um, and then there's the possibility of a one. And if this is labeled a one uh, and we add one, uh, then we end up at two. And uh, so we have one, uh, zero, and uh, zero, one. 
And that's what we have there. Those two are generators. And then finally in two, we could have minus one and minus one, but it, we're adding two, which takes us to zero. So we can have, um, um, we can have, uh, my, we can have one tensor, I'm sorry, we can have X tensor X, we can have X tensor X there. Um, that's at zero because it's minus two and two. Uh, and uh, we can have one tensor one, which is going to be two and two, which is going to be four. Okay. And that's all there is. Now, what about uh, differentials? Um, the, the differential on that X is zero because the eight is zero. So this goes to zero and comes from nowhere. Uh, and uh, I think I have room here. I'll just put a little box. Oh no, I probably better not do that. It's going to make things too messy. Let's. Well, we'll cut that a little bit. Well, I see that um, I'm better off just drawing it again. So the um, we're at, we we went minus one, one, uh, and four. So those are the only ones that are available for us. So here we are. Minus one, zero, one, two, and four. All right, so we had a Z here. Um, now, what about over here? Um, here um, from, uh, oh, um, um, I'm, uh, I'm still in row zero. And, uh, and this also goes to zero and doesn't have anybody hitting him. So this is also a Z. All right, now in one, um, in one we have, uh, we have the co-product on X is X tensor X. And the co-product on the other one is X tensor X. And the difference between them uh, will go to zero and is coming from nowhere. Um, and so we're getting a Z there. And uh, over here, um, the, um, uh, the differentials on both of these are zero, um, so um, so we're getting um, we're getting two differentials and nobody's hitting them, and so we get a z plus c. And that takes care of dimension one. And now dimension two, um, uh, x tensor x goes to zero about X tensor X is hit. Um, so there's no homology there. And over here, one tensor one goes to zero and it isn't hit. And so that appears to be the homology for chart for this guy. So your, um, your exercise is to look this over and make sure I didn't make mistake or correct my mistake if I made one and uh, to find out uh, what happens when you do it over Z. And then let's see, uh, what would be another good small virtual knot to think about uh, that would be a little harder than that one um, in analog to the trefoil, for example. Um, I think this is a good one. We should do this one.
but I think you're going to find that it will be the same as the classical trefoil. But it will be good for you to see that, good for me to see it actually work out in detail, okay? So you can consider that as, a, as another example to work. Um, the reason I say that is, you know, this is the one of the ones that has the same Jones polynomial as the classical trefoil, uh, I mean, as the unknot. And so this should, this should end up actually having, a, having trivial homology as well. So this is a good one to work. And it's three, so it has the same complexity as the trefoil. And so the exercise would be to do this one mod two. Do this one mod two, and you should find some nice and interesting kinds of cancellations going on. Um, how about another one that would be less canceled and not too huge? Could be this one. Figure eight not, but one of the crossings is made virtual, call it E. And uh, that's only got three crossings. So it would be amusing and interesting to see what the homology of that turns out to be. Mod two, let's say, to keep things from getting too complicated. But if you want to try working on over the integers and see how that goes, go ahead and do that too. Hmm? Um, let's do another one that's going to be easy as long as we're doing them. Um, let me uh, get another board. Stay with the easy one. Mod two again. Let's take the uh, virtual link with one crossing. You can't go wrong on that one. That's got to be uh, uh, easy enough to work out. Maybe we did it already. I've forgotten, but let's do it again. Mod two. So. Um, here's the Kovanov complex. It's this guy. Um, and, and the arrow goes to this guy. Mm -hmm. All together easy, right? It's a zero map. But wait a minute. All right, so it's a zero map, which means that some homology will appear because everything everything has a zero differential. So let, let's see what that looks like. Let's get the gradings in and find out how it actually looks. So we have zero and one homological. And uh, this can be as low as minus one. And this one can't be that low, it starts at zero. Um, so this one can be minus one or one, and, and then we're also going to get zero. Um, and two. So we have all those entries. Let's see what's in there. Um, okay, so over here at minus one, we have an X. And at, um, at one, we have a one. Well, those are the labels, X and one. And here we have, or here, I mean, we have, um, we have X, but X is minus one. And um, so it gets shifted up to zero. And, um, and And over here, I have a one, and um, and it gets added, shifted up to two, right? And that's that. But everybody is a cycle, and so you're getting homology here, getting homology there, you're getting homology there, and you're getting homology there. So let's see, I'm just thinking of exercises that might be 
it might be a palatable exercise to consider the family. where there's one virtual crossing. Can we understand the pattern well enough to get the mod to virtual homology for this family where there are N crossings here? Maybe that's amenable to our hand calculation. The idea is to see if we can get a feel for the virtual cohomology, virtual cohomology of things without uh, worrying about a computer. But I also promised to show you at the mod two level, how you can use drawers program to calculate virtual cohomology. So next week, program. At least mod two. All right. Now, um, okay. Uh, any questions about the exampling or any other suggestions for examples from you? Okay, let me leave this part now for a moment. So, I wanted I'm just going to go over some things in a, in a somewhat sketchy way, and then I'm going to do a little digression about something else that's interesting me this week, and that maybe got me off from telling you uh, something more detailed this time. But I think you'll find it's interesting, even though it's a digression. But right now, I wanted to talk about the form of things. So here's here's what we did so far. We talked about the canonical source sync orientation and the production of the cut points. And the cut locus involution. And, and then there is the matter of thinking about, and I just want to play with this a little bit, of thinking about the uh, Lie algebra. Uh, and the Lie algebra, you'll recall, I introduced to you a little while ago as, a, as another Frobenius algebra that gives a theory. And the two theories, the Lie theory and the Kovanov theory, are related to one another. Now I'm just talking about ordinary Kovanov homology, and then we'll, we'll see about doing it for virtuals. But in the Lie homology, there are generators R and G, and R times G, we'll come back to where it comes from in a moment. R times G is equal to zero, and R squared is equal to R, and G squared is equal to G, and R plus G is equal to one, and the, the coproduct, which I wrote D here because I didn't have a delta available when I was doing that slide, D, is two, D of R is two R, and D of G is two G. Um, and if you do do involutions, then R bar turns into G and G bar turns into R. So that's how it looks when we do it in, in virtual theory. Um, and then uh, what can happen is that you will get a cycle, uh, and I'm illustrating a cycle here uh, by smoothing this. And, I, and the smoothing that I'm taking is the ciphered smoothing. You see, I'm smoothing this in the standard oriented way, the diagram. Um, um, although the source sync orientation is on there. And then, and then um, uh, if I label it this way with an R, the R goes along and goes through the cut point and becomes a G. 
And then, so this is called labeling compatible with the cut points. Coloring of the diagram with red and green compatible with the cut points. But then you see that um, in this case, um, if you if you were to um, examine this, it would be a cycle. It's a cycle for a very simple reason because um, because that's a single cycle map and it's going to be zero. But in other cases, the, the appearance of red and G across the way from one another are going to vanish exactly because red times green is equal to zero. So let's look at another example. Um, here, I have labeled this with red and green in the same kind of way, right? Let's just check it. I'm coloring it red goes through this, turns into green, goes through that and back, fine. And here's green, and that turns into red, which uh, turns into green. And now in this case, here's a cycle, and here's another cycle. And so when you perform the boundary, you would be multiplying these, where red times green is zero. Um, and so the fact that at each of these sites, you have both red and green means that this guy is going to be a cycle. And so it turns out that um, you can figure out the combinatorics, and we'll do this in detail next time. Um, you can figure out the combinatorics for the, uh, the, the cycles in the Lee homology, and it's just basically as simple as that. You can find all the cycles. The interesting thing then, is the comparison between the Lee homology and the regular Cravano homology. And it turns out that then you can get quite a lot of information. So uh, I want to go back and play with the Lee algebra a little bit today. Um, that's all right. We won't worry about that one. So, so let me now show you where that Lee algebra comes from again and and get the red green uh, uh, definitions for it available to us. So let's play with that. So the Lee's algebra put in the usual Kovana form is, is the following, X squared Lee algebra. Oh. Um, it's a nice paper, worth your while looking at that paper, excuse me, as long as I'm thinking about the paper, let me find it. That's it. Okay. Um, I will put this into the Dropbox so you can get it. Uh, but I want to show you a couple of things that are in this paper that will be of use to you. Um, she reviews the grading and definitions of Kovana homology neatly, um, explains how the algebra works in the standard case. Um, how the cobordisms work, how the maps can be thought of in terms of cobordisms. This is reviewing the previous. And then she does the example, the very example that I said I would do for you, but uh, I would do it in my own notation. But if you want to compare and read through an example of the calculation of the classical trefoil, it's right there in her paper. Um, Nicely done. Um, so if you want to compare your results with what she gets, um, that's worth your while. Um, and then 
she discusses the invariants. So this is a good paper to read for just the basic Kravano homology from a certain point of view. And, and, then, and then she explains some theorems and, um, and uh, goes through the construction of her new algebra and her new theory. And uh, that occurs a little later on in the paper. So I will put that paper into the Dropbox along with the notes for this time. Um, but you can get it from the archive as you see. It's, um, it's available that way. OK. Now, as I said, her algebra looks like this. x squared equal to 1. The epsilon of x is equal to 1. The epsilon of 1 is equal to 0. The, and the co-product of 1 is 1 tensor x plus x tensor 1. And the co-product of x is equal to x tensor x plus 1 tensor 1. And you will recall um, from a previous lecture, and you can go back and look at it, uh, that we derived this algebra and a more general algebra that encompassed both the Kravonov algebra and this algebra um, from the Kravordism point of view. And you can also do exercises, I say it, so there are all sorts of amusing exercises you could do here um, to check that this is indeed a Frobenius algebra, that it satisfies the right identities with respect to the Kravordisms of surfaces and so on. Um, let's just do one just for the fun of it. Uh, suppose that we had started with this. And, and maybe we did the co-product first. And then we did the product. And then we'll just do one, one example. But then I could also have done it in the other order. Excuse me. <coughs> oh, um, I could have done the product first. And then the co-product. So um, mm, let's see, how about a one and an X? So, so then doing the co-product here, we would get one tensor X plus X tensor one. Tensor X. Pardon me, and um, and then we're going to multiply the uh, the second two terms. So I'd better write that out a little more carefully. One tensor x tensor x plus x tensor one tensor x, and then we're going to be multiplying the second two terms, and that will end up going to one tensor one because x squared is 1 plus x tensor x. Now, if you did it in the other order with 1 and x, then you would multiply 1 and x, and you would get x. And then you would co-multiply x. And as you see, co-multiplying x gives you x tensor x plus 1 tensor 1. So it's working, right? Okay. Um, oh.
So now let me keep the algebra and, and use the board for rewriting the algebra. Yeah. So So let me let R be equal to one plus X over two and G to be equal to one minus X over two. Um, and I want to calculate R squared and G squared and some of those other things and show you that they work. So let's take R squared. R squared is going to be one quarter of one plus two X plus x squared, which is equal to one quarter of one plus two x plus one, which is equal to one half of one plus x, which is equal to r. So r squared is r. And g squared is equal to g by the same token. Let me check that. Um, and um, uh, what about rg? Well, RG is equal to one quarter of one plus X times one minus X, which is equal to one quarter of one minus X plus X minus X squared. X squared is one, but zero, right? And R plus G is certainly equal to one. Mm -hmm. And what about X times R? X times R is equal to X plus X squared over two, which is equal to X plus one over two, which is equal to R. And similarly, X times G is equal to X minus X squared over two, which is equal to X minus one over two, which is minus G. So XR is R and XG is minus G. Um, and uh, we would like a couple more. We would like delta of R and delta of G. Let's see if I can do delta of R for you here. There's delta of R. Delta of R is delta of one plus delta of X divided by two. And delta of one is one tensor X plus X tensor one. And delta of X is X tensor X plus one tensor one, all divided by two. And if you look at that carefully, you see that you are looking at, sorry, I'm running out of board space at the bottom. 1 plus x tensored with 1 plus x divided by 2. Is that obvious, right? You got 1, 1, 1 x, x1, x, x. There they are. Um, and this is twice the tensor product of R and R. So that delta of R is twice R tensor R and delta of G is equal to G ten twice G tensor G. So you see that this is a, a pleasant uh, rewrite for the basis of that algebra. And, um, and as I indicated to you on the previous slides, it's going to help in thinking about the structure of cycles in the algebra. And we're going to, um, we're going to systematize next time uh, uh, the, um, uh, the theorem that, uh, that um, the cycles are all easily obtained from ciphered smoothings of the link diagram and how that generalizes by putting in the cut points to a Lee homology for virtuals. 
um, I think I want to stop at that point with this and go on to the aggression that I had in mind, but uh, just a moment. Let's just do a simple uh, example. Here's a classical example. Here is truffle knot, and uh, let's take the cipher smoothing of that truffle knot. And as you can see, I can perfectly well make a cycle for that by labeling it that way. And that the, the, the uh, lead complex is generated by labeled, labeled loops, just like the uh, Kravanov complex is generated by labeled loops with labels coming from the algebra. And uh, there's a cycle in the uh, Lee homology because R times G is equal to zero. Um, um, and um, let's do another example, just, just to see how this is working. Take, uh, take the uh, figure eight knot. And let's look at the cipher, a cipher smoothing of the figure eight knot. So the cipher smoothing of the figure, or oh, let's just do it simply by copy and smooth. So cipher smoothing for the figure eight knot will smooth each of these in an oriented way. And if I call that one red, I can call this one green, and then I can call that one red. So do so you can do some exercises and find that uh, there is no problem creating cycles uh, in the Lee homology out of ciphered smoothings of knot diagrams, little coloring problem. Um, so coloring cycles in ciphered smoothing. gives cycles in the homology. So Lee homology turns out to be very simple, but what happens is that if, if we using, using the X minus one, one plus one grading, Um, and boundary Lee, we will have that the bound that the Lee boundary of of somebody alpha has a J which is greater than or equal to the J of the alpha. Uh, the J is not preserved under the Lee grading. So what that means is that, uh, that there's quite a different structure in the way the Lee cycles behave and the Lee elements in the Lee chain complex behave uh, to the Kovanov way. Um, and by making a comparison between them, invariant, an invariant can be, can be created. And Ross Moosen, uses this fact to make an invariant that's very subtle, 
and strong. And we can generalize it to virtuals, and I'll explain how we do that. And I'll explain some of the facts about the Rasmussen invariant next time. So I've uh, been a little sketchy about, about things today, but I'll, I will bring it together into an organized fashion for you next time about that. So since I found myself being sketchy about what I was telling you today, I thought I would tell you a, a, a little digression. So I'm going to make a digression. about a model for the Conway-Alexander polynomial. Now, there's a reason for talking about this in the framework of link homology. Uh, and that is that this model has states, and those states are a basis for the Oswald Zabo chain complex for categorifying the Alexander polynomial. And these states were states that I studied a long time ago for the uh, sake of understanding Conway Alexander. So I'm very interested in these states. and. Um, and they are single cycle states, but they happen in a different way. So I'm going to tell you about them. Um, and maybe uh, we'll be able to connect this into the rest of our discussion if we're lucky. Um, but uh, at the moment, it's a side line. And I would need to remind you of Conway's axioms first. So Conway's, Conway, Conway's axioms which are very well known. I'm just going to remind you about them. And they, they're the axioms for skein polynomials, but in this case, we're gonna do it for the Conway-Alexander polynomial delta K, nabla K of Z. So, so one, uh, there is a polynomial Nabla K of Z associated with an oriented link K such that K equivalent to K prime by Reitermeister one, two, three, if you like. In other words, full ambient isotopy implies that the polynomials are equal. Okay, exactly an invariant. It's normalized to be equal to one on the unknown. And it satisfies the skein relation. And as you know, skein relations, this means there's a diagram and it has a crossing of a positive type. And this is the same diagram with the crossing switched. And this is the same diagram with the crossing smooth. And these axioms are sufficient to calculate uniquely the polynomial is the theorem and it is invariant. So um, these two rules will let you calculate something. And the theorem is that indeed what you calculate is invariant and well-defined, and that requires some work. Um, I'm going to show you a model for this. And this model is in a book I wrote a long time ago. Now the model goes like this, and then we'll say a little more about what it means. But if you take a flat knot diagram, 
like this. Never mind about orientations either for this. Um, and choose two regions that are adjacent to one another and decide that you're not going to put them into the game I'm about to play. You'll recall that the number of regions in a diagram is equal to the number of crossings plus two. So now there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between remaining regions and crossings, three crossings, three regions. The game I'm playing is I wish to place a little marker, only one in a given region. And I succeed in this fashion. But there are other ways to do it. In fact, there are three ways to do it, and I've drawn them all. This is, these are the only ways I can associate one marker per region. So we'll call these the K states. Okay. So those are the states. And we're going to calculate the invariant from these states. I'll show you how in a moment. But uh, that's an interesting puzzle, no? Um, to put a one marker in each region that is, remains um, in such a way that um, every region receives exactly one marker. If you had a larger diagram, it might be a little harder to do that. Let's take a look at a more complex example. So I'll try to do it here. Let's see if I succeed. I guess I got one. Yep. Every region gets one marker and no regions are left out, except the two that are out of the game. Mm -hmm. OK, so here's what we're going to do to make the invariant. And then I'll tell you more about the states. But I just want to get you to the definition of the invariant. At a crossing, I'm going to put some algebra labels. and the algebra label that I put on a positive crossing goes like this, S here, that's going to be a variable, and minus S bar, and one, and one. Uh, S bar is an abbreviation for S inverse, or one over S. It's easier to write bar. At a negative crossing, We have S bar here minus S here, one and one. So not too hard to remember, I hope. And then the nabla K is equal to the sum over the states there's one state of KS where K S is equal to the product of bits of algebra T 
touched by markers. Now, that's too large an example. So let's go back to the trefoil. Trefoil oriented this way like that. You see, you see that this would be an S and that would be a minus S bar and a one and a one. So you can read you can read on the trefoil, maybe I'll just draw the trefoil a little larger so, uh, so we can put the algebra onto the trefoil. So now you see what I mean. Uh, at every crossing, there are some bits of algebra locally. And now suppose you had a state. And let's say these are the guys that we left out of the game. And let's put in three states so that we can calculate the whole polynomial. So now we can write down on each each of these states its contribution s from this one. See, the the marker marks the bit of algebra s. This marker marks a one, and this marker marks a minus s bar. This marks a minus s bar. This marks a one. This marks a minus s bar. This marks um, an s. This marks an s, and that marked a one. So the contribution to this is the product of these, which is minus one. And the product of these is minus S bar squared. And the contribution of these is S squared. So this says that the Conway polynomial is going to be minus one minus S bar squared plus S squared. But there is something I forgot to tell you which is z is equal to s minus s bar. So if you want to express it in terms of Conway z, you have to use that. So now you see this is equal to one plus s minus s bar squared, is it not, right? s squared plus, uh, oh, there's a sign error, minus minus plus, right? Minus s times minus s bar is plus s squared. So it's plus, yeah. So s squared, s bar squared, minus two s s bar is minus two plus one is minus one, right? That it is. So this is one plus c squared. And if you were to do the skein relations and work it out, you would find that that's what you got. In the interest of time, I won't do the skein relation, um, but you could do it and you would find you got the same answer. So this is, um, this is the, uh, how you can calculate a model for the Conway Alexander polynomial by summing over over these states. If you haven't seen this before, I hope you find it intriguing. I've I've been looking at it for a long time, and I still find it intriguing. Um, it comes from it comes in relation to a lot of thought about how Alexander originally defined his polynomial. If you were to look at his paper, you wouldn't see this, but it is related to what he did there. Furthermore, the states are, um, are 
part of the combinatorics of the diagrams in a very natural way, as I'll show you in a moment. But what about the skein relation? Uh, since I'm telling you about this, let's talk about the skein relation. Why do we get this skein relation? See, Conway's skein relation is that this minus this is equal to S minus S inverse in my lingo times this. We want to prove that. But we said that we would have a model where it looked like this, sum over the states, product of the bits of algebra that are marked by the markers in the states. Well, we could, we could say this a little more uh, carefully with regard to a crossing, couldn't we? With a crossing, uh, this is going to be equal to the contribution when the marker is here times S minus the contribution of S bar times the case when the marker is here. Um, plus the cases when the marker is above or below. Agreed? This is just my way of saying, there are states where the marker is this way. And those are the ones that contribute an S because this marker will fall on an S. And then you don't have to worry about whether where this marker fell. And similarly here and here and here, right? Um, but I can say more. I can say that these are the states of this diagram where the marker in this region that I just opened up must be in this direction. Maybe that's not clear what I'm saying. Let me um, let me draw a little picture. You're looking at some diagram like this. Some larger diagram like this. You know? And maybe you have a marker here. If you have a marker here, then this region probably has a marker back here somewhere, right? And if you were to smooth this crossing, if you were to smooth that crossing, and get rid of that marker, you would have a marker here. And so even though you got rid of that marker, um, this region here would still have a marker. So you'd have a state for this even by eliminating this. You could eliminate this and you'd still have a state. But the marker would be over here. So I'm going to put a little arrow saying markers that way, minus S bar times those states where the mar of the of the smooth one where the marker is this way plus this other stuff which i'm just going to write by putting a little wiggle in there meaning the markers are this way and that way right that's what happens if you are looking at the positive crossing and now I hope you will appreciate what I'm about to do, because you see, if I take the negative crossing and take a look at that, then what happens is that over here, you get a minus S bar, you get an S bar, right? And then you get the states that are this way, minus, a plus, minus S times the states that are to the right. Plus, this, the rest of it is all the same, exactly the same. The contributions are the same from both positive and negative crossings, right? 
That's what happened in our setup. So when we take the difference between one and the other, we get S minus S bar times the sum of those states where the marker is on the left in this region, plus those states where the marker is on the right in this region. And of course, that's everything. That's all that can happen. A marker is somewhere in the region, either to the left or to the right. And so this is equal to S minus S bar times the polynomial model calculated on the smoothing. And there's the Conway identity. So this is how the Conway identity is true about this model. OK, so um, now a little bit more lore about the states. So you see what they are. And then I'll tell you why they're interesting um, from the point of view of things that we're trying to do. First of all, take a look at a state. Let's, um, let's make a slightly more complicated one. Did I succeed in making one? I think I did. Now watch what happens if you smooth at every marker. Take a marker and regard it as an instruction to smooth. Okay. Oops. Huh. All right. It's all right. I mean, I just overlaid it. Cool. So if we did that, then every crossing is going to get smooth and I'll just remove them and then I'll, I'll go back to my diagram over there and understand how to do the smoothing. Okay, so now this one smooths this way. 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 And that one smooths that way. And you get what I call well, you've got a single cycle state. And, and you see it's a state in the sense of the bracket polynomial. It has one, but it has one cycle. You, get, you walk from here and you go through every edge once and you never cross at any crossing. So it can be regarded as a a puzzle about about a, about the knot diagram thought of as a roadway. You're supposed to walk along the roadway, and when you get to a cross, you're not allowed to cross. You have to turn right or left. So you turn, and then you keep going, and you um, and you uh, don't uh, go through the crossing, and you keep on going, etc., like that, and find a a pathway that uses every edge in the diagram once. And that's what these states are also. They're the, they are such things. And there are a number of other formulations for what they are combinatorially. So they're quite fundamental combinatorially and they calculate automatically the Conway-Alexander polynomial for you. Now, the curious thing is that these states, are a basis 
for the chain complex. for the O-Z-S-D-A-T-H, Oswaf and Zabo link homology. That categorifies the Conway Alexander polynomial. This is the original set of states that they that they discovered uh, to make the connection with the Con with the Conway uh, the, with the um, Conway Alexander polynomial. But there was a difficulty, and the difficulty was let S of K be equal to the K states. forming a basis for C of K, the Oswald, I notice I'm not indicating any gradings, I'm not trying to, the Oswald-Zabo chain space, chains. Um, Oswald and Zabo define a boundary mapping taking C of K into itself, right, with appropriate grading going on, um, using um, high dimensional topology. Give a combinatorial definition. This is a half open problem. For a long time, it was an open problem. Now it's a half open problem because there is um, a solution using quite a bit of algebra. By Oslo. Um, misspelling it. By Oslo. Um, and uh, you can find that. Um, in, in papers that he's written recently and a, and a survey uh, and a summary of it in a survey paper by him. But, um, but still, can we make a combinatorially Can't spell today. Combinatorially simple solution. That's a nice question. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, so you see, you would be looking for, in the case of Kovanov, remember, what we did was we said if we had an A, then the key to the boundary in the Kovanov homology is that if you had an A smoothing, um, if you have an A smoothing, then all you had to do to generate the boundary uh, at the combinatorial level was to just re-smooth it. 
And uh, basically that, that tells you everything you need to know in order, about, in order to construct the boundary in Kovano homology. Well, there's a little algebra behind it, but if you use cobordisms, then there needn't be algebra and the whole thing is constructing itself out of a natural combinatorial occurrence. Um, in the case of the states, it would appear that the following should be, certainly to anybody's eye about these states, the fact that if this is a state, you can, you can make a new state by interchanging these two markers, like rotate that one clockwise and rotate this one counterclockwise. So can we make a boundary out of this? You see, it looks like you ought to be able to, um, you know, fall over your own feet and create a boundary on the set of states as a module and get a homology theory. But when you actually try to do it, just doing it by following your nose combinatorially, it seems to turn into something subtle and complicated. So that's the interesting question. Um, and I thought I would tell you about that. Um, um, at this point. And another reason I'm telling you about that is because of some recent work that Nestle Han, uh, Gugumsu and I have been doing, which I'll probably talk about more in a, in a seminar elsewhere, but I can tell it to you now just to show you how this works a little bit for a few minutes. So suppose you're looking at, an, we talked about nautoids and this is a nautoid thing. Suppose you're looking at a nautoid and you might wonder, well, could you do this um, game of, uh, of the Conway potential function um, on the nautoid uh, with markers? And the answer is, yeah, you can, but it comes out a little differently, um, but you can. And what we're going to do now is we're going to have, what, we're going to have a, a one excluded region which is the region containing one end of the nautoid. So this star means everything out here. And, and now you'll notice that I now have one, two regions and two crossings. And I can play my same game. I'll put a marker here and I'll put a marker here, but there's a little leeway, funny little leeway. I can do that or I can also put a marker here and put a marker there, huh? right? Um, those are both possible. Um, I, I don't have the option of putting a marker here because then I would be unable to put a marker in this. Oh no, no, I do have the option, I'm sorry. So let's continue enumerating. I could put a marker here and then I would have to put the other marker here. And then you can add up those states in exactly the same way that I was doing it before. And you will find yourself producing an analog of the Conway Alexander polynomial for nautoids. We're working on a paper on that. Maybe in a couple of weeks, you'll see it. Um, but that's why this question gets raised again, because here's the nice question I asked before about Kovanov homology for nautoids, and I pointed out that we could do it by using our Montorov method, um, but on nautoids. But here the question is, um, uh, link homology of Oswath Sabo type or nautoids. And we're working on it. We'll see what happens. But um, a good way to go would be if we understood a simple way to put the boundary on the combinatorics, and then it probably could get transferred here. Um, in the lieu of that, it may be that we can transfer the method of the recent Oswath paper, which is more complex, but we're working on that. So this is just a little 
a little research report about about that aspect of things and um and and to tell you about these single cycle states that occur naturally in the classical topology so i'll stop there today Yeah, thank you very much. So the, the last uh, approach to an authority is just a work in progress. Yeah, that's all work in progress. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, uh, thank you for your talk. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 the so-called uh, OS homology is the usually called uh, not floral homology. Yes, that's right, not floral homology. I wanted okay. to identify it with with those guys. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, then uh, I heard that uh, the not floral homology has a uh, 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 has a combinatorial. Uh, oh yeah, I, I I was running out of time, so I didn't mention. Let me share a screen for one second here. Um, um, OS equals not floor. Yeah. Homology has combinatorial description via grid diagrams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've talked about grid diagrams before. That means that yeah. uh, that you are uh, you are representing your knots by by things like this, knots and links by things like this where yeah. where the where where you then can combinatorialize in terms of the locations of these endpoints on a grid, and then there's a very interesting and beautiful combinatorial description of it there, where the nice combinatorial boundary and everything, um, and it comes from their high dimensional description by looking at it in a certain way, uh, and the question has been for a long time whether there would be a nice combinatorial description using the states that I just mentioned. Well, oh, so the relationship of, uh, of those two, two kinds of uh, yeah, yeah, diagram, diagrammatic uh, description is unknown, so, uh, okay. Uh, right, it, it, we don't know how to translate between the, between the combinatorial boundary on, on the states that come from, from the grid diagrams and, oh. the, and the FKT states. Okay. Yeah. So the marker. So we can ask how are marker states related to grid combinatorics? Oh. Okay. Oh. Oh. Thank you. If you wanted to think about it, you could, of course, you could you could superimpose them. But I, I haven't had too much structure to success by just superimposing. Superimposing would be you you take a take yourself a grid diagram of a knot, like here's a nice grid diagram of the truffle knot, right? And uh, then it it lives on a lattice and it has a tic tac toe description O X O X O X, mm -hmm. and and then out of the points in the lattice comes the complex um, mm -hmm. that they describe. But how how is that structure related to the marker states, which are right there? You can see the marker states as well, like the ones I described for you. They're there, right? Um, you can you can draw them in the rectilinear form, and examine how they behave um, perfectly well there, like that, like that, like that. Um, and so they're there. And maybe by superimposing them, by watching how they behave in relation to the combinatorics, one would get a clue. Okay. Thank you. 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 Th
You can think about it. Oh, yeah. okay. okay, thank you. Um, you just so have to realize you have to realize that when you're doing that, you're um, you're playing in the dark, and uh, and you might find something interesting, or you might get lost. You know, just be careful. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, and uh, I want to ask: uh, uh, Are there any? Uh, is there any uh, uh, topological explanation of the uh, individual uh, coefficients of Alexander polynomial? Not the whole Alexander uh, each coefficient. Wait, wait. Uh, is there a topological explanation for what? A uh, coefficient of Alexander polynomial or Conway polynomial. I, I think I missed a word you said. It sounded like coincidence, but it wasn't. Oh, so coefficient. Coefficients. Coefficients. Oh, the coefficients. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, in the in these categorified theories, the coefficients are ranks yeah, oh, of yeah. homology groups, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, in that sense, one is getting topological uh, interpretations of the coefficients. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, only in, the, in this, oh, okay. Oh. From the point of view of classical topology, yeah, it's very interesting because you start with something that has a, a very nice combinatorial interpretation. You might start with um, a spanning surface for the knot mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. curves on the spanning surface and the linking numbers that they can have if you push them away from one another a little bit. That's called yeah. the ciphered pairing. And it may, it's a topological measure of the way the surface is embedded in space. Yeah. And then the Alexander polynomial comes out from that as um, as a as a determinant uh, of a of a certain thing, and then it begins to be harder to interpret the coefficients of such a thing in in a direct topological way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is the explanation topological explanation of the the whole polynomial, not the uh, uh each single uh, yeah, coefficient. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's right. But but if you ask for the meaning of single coefficients, well, there is an enormous literature on the second coefficient of the Conway polynomial. It's related to the ca so-called Casson invariant. So there's a big story about that one, um, but there is no general um, understanding of the meaning of the coefficients in a way that would be satisfying to a geometric topologist. So there are many mysteries there. <laughs>